And hello, everyone, and welcome to Thursday night of Monsoon Awareness Week. And I'm excited about tonight. Tonight's a fun night for me. I love lightning. And um, it's just something that has always fascinated me. I've always enjoyed it. I've done lightning photography in my past. I don't do it anymore. I leave that to the, the younger folk. But I've always enjoyed looking at lightning pictures. We have in the Southwest, we have some of the most spectacular lightning, and we have some of the best lightning photographers. I know around Tucson and Phoenix and El Paso, people are always snapping pictures. I've seen some from Albuquerque. Um, just beautiful, beautiful pictures of lightning. Lightning is beautiful. Lightning is very impressive to look at, but it also, as most of us know, can be very dangerous and unfortunately, on occasion, deadly. And we're gonna talk about all of that tonight. Uh, this is Monsoon Awareness Week. We've been having a great week. We've been having nightly discussions about each of the threats related to monsoon season. On Monday, we talked about heat, which is actually, that is the, the main threat that we are looking at across most of the Southwest this, uh, this coming weekend is it is going to get very hot into the first part of next week. Matter of fact, I was talking with uh, James and he was saying that Phoenix is looking at, what did you say, 121, 120? 120 degrees. Yay, 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 yay. So there are, needless to say, there are already um, heat highlights or heat warnings for the Phoenix, Tucson area. Um, El Paso's not quite as warm as 120, thankfully. Uh, neither is Albuquerque, but I'm sure Vegas is way up there as well. So keep, just stay safe, because the heat is the name of the game this week. And we talked about that all on Monday. On Tuesday, we talked about downburst winds. Yesterday, we had a great discussion on blowing dusts. And then today, like I said, we're gonna be talking about lightning tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tomorrow, if you'd like to tune in, we're going to be talking about flash flooding. But before we get started again, I want to introduce myself. I get ahead of myself. Uh, my name is Tim Bryce, and I am a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. We've got a great panel of people joining us today. I'm going to just run down the line real quickly here. And we've got, ah, it's always a challenge for me to click. Okay, so we got Dan LeBlanc from the Flagstaff office. How are you doing, Dan? Very well, thank you. Very well. Good. We got uh, James Sautel. He is from the Phoenix office where it's going to be toasty warm this weekend. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me. No, I'm glad you could join us. Uh, as always, my uh, my co-partner in crime is Marissa Pazos, forecaster from El Paso. She always pulls off all these great graphics, and I'm sure she's going to have some great ones for tonight. I love the lightning. All right, moving on down the line, Mr. John Bennett who is the meteorologist in charge from the Albuquerque office. He's the big kahuna up there. How are you, I'm Sean? Not gonna fail. <laughs> and from our friends over in San Diego, the beautiful beaches where they have no weather in San Diego is Miss no. Stephanie Sullivan and Miguel Miller. It's How are you guys you. doing today? <laughs> True. Actually, we if you've joined us for the You've learned that San Diego has some pretty crazy weather being right on the coast, but they also have a lot of topography. So that's been very fascinating to learn and hear. Well, I want to encourage everybody who is watching, uh, you can comment on the YouTube links, you know, the YouTube chat. You can comment with a hashtag of uh, Monsoon 2017. And once somebody gets talking here, I'll put my lower third back up so everyone can see that hashtag. Or if the, I'm not sure if the Facebook feed is going out live right now, but if it is and you're watching on Facebook, please comment there and we'll try to answer any of your questions. So we've got this great esteemed panel here. We're gonna be talking lightning. We're gonna be talking about what causes lightning, some of the lightning safety ticks. Hey, it's Chris Rasmussen. How are you, sir? Oh, actually it's Jim Meyer and we've got, uh, oh. I'm sorry, your name? Ron Holly. Ron Mr. Holly. Lightning. He knows me. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Ron. I am glad that Ron has joined us. Ron is our lightning expert, and um, he slid in here right at the right at the beginning of the hangout. So slide on over here, Ron, and I want to introduce you, Ron, and then we're going to kind of just start talking about things because I, I just introduced everybody else. Ron yeah. Holly works for, and I'm going to let him say the company. I know the company, but I always pronounce it slightly wrong because I always say Vaisala. But Ron, how do you say the name of your company? It's, it's Vaisala. Vaisala, it's a Finnish. Okay. 
<laughs> it is a Finnish company. They always seem to accent the name a little bit differently than uh, the way I uh, I like to I like to accent it. So I'm gr I'm so glad that you were able to slide in here at the last minute. So Ron is our guest expert of the of the evening. Well, let's get started with a, a quick question. And maybe Ron, if you're settled and ready, can I can I ask you a question here? Because I think you know the answer. Yeah, go ahead. Ready? Okay, uh, the question for Ron is, what causes lightning? Well, the, <clears throat> the essential ingredients that you need for lightning are an updraft, and the updraft going through minus 10 to minus 20 Celsius level. And um, you need, at that point, you need to have a mixture of water and ice crystals and small hail, or we call it grapple. That mixture up at the minus 10 to minus 20 level is what really kicks off lightning. All lightning starts with uh, temperatures colder than freezing, say, say it that way. <clears throat> and so the way I understand things, Ron, it's, it's, it's very akin to um, you run, walk across the carpet during the winter for some places. You build up that static electricity, and then you reach for that that metal uh, doorknob or whatever it happens to be. You know where it happens to me all the time is when I'm in the grocery store and I'm walking around and I, I reach for that metal handle for the milk or whatever it is. It's basically a static electric, electric charge. The wind and the, the particles are moving around, bouncing off each other, building up that charge. And eventually that charge builds up. And essentially, if I'm not wrong here, correct me, lightning is just a big giant uh, electrical spark. Is that not correct? Yes, it is. Um, years ago, I asked Dr. Martin Newman, who's one of the great uh, lightning researchers who's semi-retired at the University of Florida, and he said if there wasn't lightning, that when we reached out like to the cart, we'd have sparks that were two or three feet long. So the lightning <laughs> keeping the atmosphere from doing that, it wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. So actually lightning has some purpose in that regard. Very good. Hey, uh, Ron, if you can, yeah, slide your can. Perfect. You, you read my mind. That's awesome. Um, well, yes, better. Oh, see, Miss Marzna has a nice picture. Can you kind of describe here what we're, what's pictured here on your screen with this picture? Well, those are uh, fairly typical. Oh, okay, Tim, you're going to talk about that. No, you got it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, most of cloud-to-ground lightning lowers negative charge from that minus. 10 to minus 20 layer to ground. It builds up um, in a normal vertical structure. About 5 or 10% of all lightning actually lowers positive charge to ground. And then we know now that there are probably about three times as many um, flashes between the clouds, in the clouds, from cloud to air, than there are that come to ground. So actually there's a lot of lightning, as you see when you look at a storm, that's actually in the cloud. Wow, that's amazing. You know, I, I've always enjoyed the lightning when it you can it illuminates the clouds, especially at night, and especially here in the southwest. We get that we got that just clear, clear um, can see a long, long way off. So again, I keep um, I keep saying lightning is just beautiful. It's great to look at, but it 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 and it's dangerous to people, and it's dangerous to I know the livestock and things like that. And I know, Sean, your story to everyone that you have about lightning. Sure. Um, it's a sad story because about 40 years ago, I lost my brother to lightning. Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, I was, I was not in the weather service. Uh, I was just about ready to enter the Navy. In fact, I'd already signed up. It was the end of May, 1978. We lived in Northeast Oregon. He was out fishing next to a lake and um, thunderstorm came up and he did the wrong thing. He didn't know to do. I know now he did the wrong thing at the time. What he did is uh, he was out there with uh, his best friend fishing and uh, he got under a big ponderosa pine tree get away from the rain and uh, as luck would have it and that's not good luck it hit the tree 
he was closest to the tree and uh it killed him it got his friend too but he was another six feet away so mm. his friend was hurt but he was killed and you know um he did what most human beings will do and uh and that is they want to get out of the rain and right. so and in that time uh he just did what was sort of instinctual, get out of the rain. What I know now and what's what I really would like to say about the Southwest is that um, we have lightning that comes with storms that we have uh, what we call virga, our term for like veiled rain, that, that you get very light rain coming down from the clouds because the air is so dry near the surface. And so a lot of times people will not go under into in, inside or into a covered area away from the weather because it's really not raining and we have incidences uh where they unfortunately were struck i think the last most troubling case was one where they were out watching i think a fourth of july fireworks or something and a little bit of virga rain was coming down and there was lightning and they were walking to their car and a family like four or five got struck here in Rio Rancho. The, the father was killed. Mm. So we have others that it's, uh, you know, other cases here just a couple of years ago near Carrizozo, uh, a couple riding motorcycles of all things. And uh, a person was hit riding their motorcycle. Um, so they really weren't doing anything wrong except they were outside. And right. I'm sure it wasn't raining really heavy. That's why they were still riding, and they got struck while they're moving in the motorcycle. Of course, the motorcycle is not like a car because it's not covered. So that's the thing that I try to get the picture out about lightning in the southwest, or it was before in uh, Florida. When a thunderstorm goes there, it dumps tons of rain, and uh, it doesn't. It, it, it isn't any problem for people to recognize. I need to get out of the rain. The other thing I tell people is when, and the phrase that we use, right, is when thunder roars go indoors. So you don't actually have to be inside of the thunderstorm to be struck by lightning either. And we know this from research. So um, there's a lot of, of cases where people have uh, been struck where they're not actually inside the thunderstorm or even getting hit by rain. So if they do hear the thunder, they should, uh, seek shelter in a covered enclosed area and uh, that's what people really need to remember about lightning uh, we do have a fairly high um, in new mexico per capita loss although that trend is downward because we have a population like the other states in the southwest where people are outside quite a bit in the summertime and so uh, per capita we have a lot of uh, more of the lightning fatalities than we'd wish to have. But um, we haven't had one in a couple of years now, I believe it is. So let's hopefully we keep that uh, trend going that way. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey John, John, I appreciate, I appreciate you, you. You, you sharing because I think it, it helps to drive home when you make it personal like that, that be, part of the problem with lightning, like heat, it's an underrated killer. It's, it's maybe underrated. It's not the the right word, but un, under advertised word, uh, under advertised kind of killer that it picks off people one at a time, here, there, and and you don't hear about it. But I think Marissa has a graphic here that shows that. Let me see if I can get it here. Lightning ranks pretty well up there as far as. On a 30-year average, it's one of the, the bigger killers as far as people. Now, I know that used to be a lot higher. You used to be, I'm pretty sure, up towards the hundreds, you know, a couple decades ago. So, Sean, you're talking about getting that education out, that, that message out. I do think we're making a difference. As a matter of fact, hey, Marissa, look up the, uh, the, the stats. If you do uh, lightning fatalities and then NOAA.gov, you'll find uh, for this year, we're almost halfway through the year, and so far, officially reported, at least as far as NOAA.gov goes, there's only been one lightning fatality this year so far. 
So uh, it's it's sad that we had one. I, I think, like you mentioned, Sean, I think sh this person was a, a woman that was riding horseback in Colorado. I know it says lightning deaths zero up there, but it, there is one in Colorado for this year. So it, it happened there on uh, May 7th. So we're, you, you know, I think we're, we're getting the message out to everyone. Tim, we've had Go exactly ahead. the same uh, type of fatality in, in New Mexico. A fellow was riding horseback along the fence line. I think it was near the Farmington area and was struck and killed. So um, you would think uh, riding a horse is not a dangerous activity, but uh, the lightning bolt is a very, very powerful uh, uh, instrument of nature. So we, we want to be away from it whenever we can. Uh, Tim, yes, last, um, last year, go ahead. there were 38 people killed in the U.S. last year, and we thought it, everything had gone bad, and we were wondering about the, all our safety advice and everything else, and now this year comes along with one, so it is variable, but it's average in the 20s or low 30s for the last 10 years, so last year was way high, this year is unaccountably low, so uh, it won't end up this low, unfortunately. No, I, I, yeah, unfortunately, it, it won't. But hey, Marissa, put that graphic back up there that showed over the years so we can see kind of the graphic of how the lightning deaths have changed over time. Um, unfortunately, not now. I, people on Facebook, let's see, uh, Jorge Garcia is on here. He mentioned that one of his acquaintance was killed a couple years ago in a hiking accident. Uh, again, it, it seems like a lot of these uh, are happening outside. Let me uh, throw this up here real quick that Marissa has. So these are the lightning fatalities through the last ooh, 10, 11 years. And you can see, like like Ron mentioned, it kind of we were up pretty high in 2007. Then we'd kind of slip back down, and then we've jumped back up. Now we've, you know, 2016 saw kind of a, a high total, but now we've kind of fallen back. And like Ron said, unfortunately, uh, it won't end up at one, but hopefully it won't end up many more. Now, at the very bottom of the screen, I don't know if everyone can see it, but it says uh, 66 women in the last 11 years have been uh, struck and killed by lightning and 239 men. And let me let me pick on, uh, let's see, Stephanie and uh, Miguel. Guys, does, is lightning just naturally attracted to men more than uh, women? Why, why are men more at risk when it comes to being uh, killed by lightning? My guess is that uh, it's just because I, I, I would say men in general go outside more, especially in the summertime. You'll see them more backpacking, golfing, fishing, whatever it is they might be doing outside. So. Uh, that's my guess. It doesn't have any uh, uh, substance to support. I don't have anything to support that, but that's just my guess. Um, no, I, I'm pretty sure you're exactly right that over the years that, that I've seen that men just, you've got, you've got football, you've got like the hike and hunting, just men happen to be out more. And, and I'm going to knock guys here. I think men are just a little more stubborn that they see the thunderstorm, they hear the thunder, and they just want to pass in. They just want to get that last hole in on the golf course. They just want to maybe, maybe like Sean said, his, his brother, just get under the tree. They'll be okay. They don't make his decision. And um, it's, I've seen I, – I've done it myself that, you know, I, it's just a thunderstorm. It, 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 it probably won't happen to me, but – so many times and as you can see on those statistics that uh, i had from that marissa provided me only does it not uh it, those are just fatalities um ron do you know off the top of your head and i don't know off the top of your head maybe marissa you can look it up how many people are struck by lightning in the united states each year not necessarily who are uh, who uh, die from a lightning strike well the the ratio that we think applies in the developed countries is 10 injuries for every death. So last year we had 38, so nominally 380 injuries. Okay. It's hard to come up with the individual okay. pieces. That's why we follow the fatalities so much, because we always hear about right. them. They're, we always hear about the injuries. They're a little more well uh, publicized. Um, yeah. Wow. And, and then if you're struck by lightning, 
it has an effect, immediate effect, but what if I remember right, and anybody on the panel here can can chime in if you guys have experience with this or know this, um, but as I understand it, when you're struck by lightning and it doesn't kill you, you end up having issues, neurological or other problems, headaches and things for potentially the rest of your life. It's just not a one and done kind of thing. It actually um, causes damage that is uh, very difficult to heal from. Anyone? Yeah, I've I've been to the unfortunately a meeting of the lightning strike and electric shock survivors, which is a pretty difficult meeting to go to. About half the people are lightning, and half of them are electric shock from touching wires and so on. And not everyone who's injured has really bad long-term things, but the neurological memory loss, motor loss, um, all the things in the functions in the brain are substantially uh, compromised often for the rest of their life and it affects the rest of the family. So it's not something you really want. Right. Now there, there's all kinds of threats and um, hey Dan, can you go over some of the maybe, let's start to go over because I want to go over several different kinds of safety tips because you do different things in different situations. If you are outside and um, there's not any good cover. I, I, we'll talk about in a little while what good cover is, but if you're outside and it's you in a field and a bunch of trees, and what what is the best thing to do? Okay, well, first, first of all, hopefully you would uh, like to have an idea of what the weather patterns are, what time thunderstorms, mm -hmm might be forming in your area. Uh, let's say you do get caught outside. You would want, you would not want to be on the, the tallest part of a hill or a ridge top. If you are in a forest, you want to be among the shortest trees in the area, not the tallest. Right. Uh, if you happen to be in a group, you want to spread out and be 150 feet away from each other. And uh, if you're camping, you don't want to set your tent up again on a high point or a ridge. Tents offer no protection in uh, lightning events. So basically you're saying is not make yourself a target. That's correct. Hey, let me let me ask Ron here real quick. Why does and I, I think I know the answer, but I'm, I'm sure you'll give it give it in a better way. Why does lightning seem to pick on people? Why does it or or even livestock? You know, why does it why doesn't it just zap from the cloud to the ground? Boom. Why does it if there's a human nearby, it tends to want to go to that human? Well, this goes back to the main five mechanisms of how people are killed by lightning. The most unlikely one is the direct strike coming, let's say, come down and hit you in the head. We think it only happens three to five percent of the time. It hardly ever happens. But the most common scenario is that it hits nearby and comes across the ground over to the to people, and that's why cattle are um, killed so often is because their feet are farther apart because they have a bigger potential voltage across their body. That's pretty well known. So. Um, the brown current is the most important one. Another one is uh, touching things like uh, plumbing and wiring or a tree. Uh, another one is the uh, uh, upward leader coming from the head where it's trying to connect with the lightning coming down. And uh, step voltage is still the biggest one on the ground. So it uh, does affect people in that regard more, but that's also the lightning only lasts a couple of tenths of a second, and so it's a relatively short event. If it lasted longer than that, everyone would die, but that's the why not everyone dies. We're not hearing you. Tim, you're muted. Mr. Tim, you're muted. Thank you. 
Sorry about that. I was uh, I didn't want to click on something. Sorry. Hey, I want to go back to Dan real quick. Um, I because one of the wives' tales that I've heard is that you mentioned not. You know, I kind of put words in your mouth. You're not trying to make yourself a target. You kind of get down low, avoid the trees, avoid ridge lines. You know, some people said, well, the best thing to do is kind of maybe squat down or even lay down on the ground. That's when you're the lowest. And and I can I, I know Ron Ron already knows that's the wrong answer. <laughs> Dan, is that your your understanding too that that laying down on the ground is the the wrong thing to do? Is that correct? That is that is correct. Uh, what I've been reading is that you yeah. actually want to squat down. Okay. And um, because when you're laying down, you're putting more of your body, I guess, spread out over the land, ground so that if the current comes down like a tree or something, it spreads out through that ground and it, it'll uh, more of your body or go through more of your body. How does kind of explain to us, Ron, how that works? Well, what that the reason that's a mistaken impression is that the direct strike, which is what all the stories of people have come up with, is the most common one, and it's actually the least common one. I, I, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm not a big fan of talking about what to do when you're caught. You really need to mm -hmm. avoid being there, and Good the best point. solution is to go as fast as possible to a safe building or a safe vehicle. Um, instead of stopping and doing the crouch and all those things, run to the car, run to the building. Well, uh, I, and you bring up a good point because I've heard people say that one of the other wives tells is that it's, you're safe in the car because the uh, rubber of the tires. Um, is that the reason you're safe in the car or is, is there something else that, that, that helps protect you in a car? Well, that's a completely mistaken um, sequence. The, you're safe in the car because you have a Faraday cage around you. You have a metal cage, and cars are hit all the time. I have a whole folder full of ca cases, hundreds of cases, with people inside. And uh, it's scary, and you want to get out if it gets on fire, of course, but you're still safer than you were if you were outside. So what happens is the lightning hits the um, metal s surrounding of the car, travels around, and as it tries to reach ground, what does it go to? It goes to the axles. And what do the axles have around it? It has tires. So it blows the tires arcing over to the ground. And so the tires blow. But that was a totally consequent consequence uh, of the event, not the cause of the safety. So it's a, it's a backwards thought process. It is. Um, so you mentioned Faraday cage. Um, the way I, I, I describe it to people is basically um, treat uh because lightning is basically electricity and in many ways it flows like a fluid and if you have if you pour water on a car it just flows around the outside of the car down to the ground um, lightning does the same thing if it strikes the top of the car i used to tell people if it strikes the antenna but these days i don't think a lot of cars have antennas anymore the top of the car it will flow down like you said the sides and then go down the axles and um, i've heard stories where it actually shoots holes through the tires anything to get it to that ground cloud to the ground is way you're trying to move that charge right right so you are safe in a car but it, it's it's not for the reasons that you're thinking of it's because not because of the rubber in the tires but because of the the metal of the car because we all, you know, most of us have tennis shoes, and I've heard people say, I'm safe from lightning because I'm walking around in my, my rubber sole tennis shoes. But again, uh, you know, one inch of rubber lightning bolt, it just passed through several miles of the atmosphere. Hmm. Analogy there? Right. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, I I don't want to leave uh, James out because he's been sitting here listening to everything. James, what are what is your some of your experiences there in the Phoenix area with lightning and maybe uh, throw in your your favorite lightning safety tip? Well, um, why why do cars keep you safe from lightning? The Faraday cage was mentioned, and uh, for our viewers, um, basically what that's referring to is that. Uh, uh, lightning uh, is attracted to conductors and metal is a conductor. Um, so when the lightning strikes the 
body of the car, because the car is made of metal, metal is an excellent conductor of electricity. The electricity will flow along the outside body of the car. Similarly, if you're in an airplane, most airplanes are made out of aluminum or a metal alloy. And so if you're in an airplane, in most cases, when lightning strikes, it's going to stay around the fuselage, the exterior of the airplane, and the occupants will be safe. Um, there's, of course, when it comes to lightning, there probably are no absolute guarantees, but by following the safety tips that we've talked about, you can dramatically put the odds in your favor and um, some people might have read a little bit about the new 787 Dreamliner that has a composite fuselage. Well, how am I going to be safe if I'm driving, if I'm flying in a 787 Dreamliner with a composite fuselage since it doesn't conduct electricity? Uh, well, what they've done in that aircraft is they've uh, developed a copper mesh that they've actually uh, attached to the fuselage and the copper mesh uh, conducts electricity and was put and is uh, designed on that aircraft specifically to help diffuse the lightning and keep the occupants safe, just as safe as if they were in a metal fuselage aircraft. Um, also, you know, if, you know, I can just feel a lot of people out there thinking, well, what if I'm out in the middle of the field? Um, and uh, the only place I have to go is maybe, maybe a car. Um, am I safe there? Well, yeah, I've, you're a lot safer than being out in the field. And uh, the, right. the other thing about being inside a car is once, once you're, You've taken refuge inside the car. Don't touch any of the metal items inside the car. Um, so don't touch the door handle or or anything that's metal. You probably you know you probably don't want to be driving along uh, because you might that might force you to touch your part. So don't touch anything metal inside the car and, and avoid touching exterior surfaces, um, interior surfaces to the exterior. Um, if you're inside a house, there's things that make the house safer. And those include don't use a landline phone while you're inside the house. Don't take a shower or touch any plumbing when you're inside a house because the metal conducts the electricity. And like you were saying, Tim, uh, lightning is very similar to water in that it cruises. And in the uh, case of lightning, it cruises through metal. So no pipes, uh, no landline phones, no showers, don't shave, uh, you know, don't be cooking. Uh, washing vegetables at the sink. Um, and uh, you're safe to use a cell phone or a wireless phone. Feel free to use those phones, but not a landline phone. Right, right. If, if you're a coach, uh, you know, here in Phoenix, Phoenix is a mecca for recreational activities. People here just love the outdoors. We a lot of our tourism is based on on the love for outdoors. Pe people will travel here just to hike or play golf or play tennis. And so we, we have a, you know, a big enthusiastic outdoorsy community here. And um, so what I would say to re uh, recreational enthusiasts and sportsmen and um, other people en who enjoy the outdoors is um, always have a plan. Always think about what you might want to do. Um, 
You might want to load some good weather apps in your smartphone so you can keep track of thunderstorms. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, Tim, when the thunder roars get indoors, it's been my experience that if you hear thunder, it might be sort of a quiet rumble thumber, thunder and you might think, well, you know, that doesn't sound too bad, you know, because I saw the flash and then it took, you know, seven or eight seconds for the thunder to reach my ears. But if you, it's been my experience and there, and there's been a few exceptions in my experience, but in most of my experience, if I hear thunder, that means I'm approximately uh, two miles or less from where the lightning bolt is. Uh, if, if, you, if you see a flash and then you hear thunder, you can start counting and it's approximately a fifth of a mile for each second uh, for the distance between the lightning bolt and you. So you just see the lightning bolt and you start counting and when you hear the thunder, if uh, five seconds has gone by, that's one mile, 10 seconds, that's two miles. If you see a lightning bolt and you never hear the thunder, it's been my experience that more than likely that uh, lightning bolt is two miles or greater away from you because a lot of times this sound that's greater than two miles away won't actually reach you unless it's a, a super bolt that's much larger than normal and whose sound carries uh, maybe if it's lucky as far as three miles. And so you say, okay, well, right, I'm, right. let's say you see a lightning flash and you count to 10, you say, oh, that's two miles away, I'm safe. Well, you're, you're not safe. That's, that's way too close. You need to get indoors. When the thunder roars, get indoors. Uh, period. Exactly. You know, you know, that's, a, that's a great point that you said there. When thunder roars, gets indoors. You know, I was reading something that says that for the threat of thunderstorms, the lightning is the first threat to arrive, is the last threat to leave. I think Marissa has that graphic there that shows that you're really not safe you got to wait about 30 minutes until the after you've heard the last rumble of thunder, right? That's right. And um, along with that idea is the idea that thunder can strike uh, 10 to 15 miles away from a thunderstorm. And in some cases, 10 to 15 miles, you might even, not even see the thunderstorm. Like if you're in a valley or someplace, um, you might not even see the thunderstorm. Uh, so there are cases of lightning traveling an unusually long distance to strike. And um, if, you know, if you're a coach and you're responsible for kids on a team and there's a lot of, I know, you know, I'm from El Paso. So I remember that El Paso is a big outdoorsy city, just like Phoenix. And, you know, you see a lot of, um, little leagues and soccer leagues and lots of coaches out here with the kids coaches have an extra responsibility for the safety of the kids and mm -hmm. one of one of the things that they should really respect is the lightning hazard and and they should keep track of the thunderstorms on their smartphone and don't wait till you if you're responsible for some kids, don't wait till you hear the thunder. You know, if you see the thunderstorms on the radar and it's in in the part of the city and it looks like they're building in towards you or whatever, you know, call off the practice and get the kids home. Right. You, when you're in your charge of kids, and it, it, not only if you're in charge of kids, just in charge of yourself, that is, you got to take some uh, responsibility because lightning is one of those challenges for meteorologists. We we can see the thunderstorms on satellite. We can see the satellites on rate, or we can see the thunderstorms on radar. But in all actuality, underneath that thunderstorm, we don't know where that lightning is going to strike. And like um, said, it can be sometimes that bolt from the blue way out ahead of the storm. 
Uh, sometimes it can be back behind it. Now, I think Marissa, you got a graphic. You got the video of the 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 slow mo of the lightning, Ron. We're going to show a super slow mo of lightning, and can you kind of describe what we're looking at as the lightning propagates down from the cloud? As soon as uh, let me see if I can get it up here. And okay, so we yeah, see I, kind of a flash. <clears throat> yeah, I know, I know this video very well. What you see is is cloud two ground it's coming down and it's coming down in 50 yard steps it's coming down and the first step to the ground wins and that's what it hits <laughs> and it's quite unpredictable which one of those look at all those um downward leaders that are coming down um it's relatively random as to which one of those is going to hit but it looks <clears throat> so once it makes that connection and you see the brightness, that is the um, um, current going back up the channel, but it originally lowered charge down the channel. So the channel right. is made up of a whole bunch of approximately 50 yard long steps. It comes down, it comes down, it comes down, it looks around at the bottom for what it's going to hit. If you go back th through it again, you can see all the different parts of it when you get this high resolution images there's a lot and, of nice ones like this so you can see that it, and with the, the the first one with these step leaders you can't actually see them it's too faint and it's too fast actually for the naked eye to see that part of the lightning right yeah it's it's very faint it's not nearly as bright as the, when the connection is made and the light goes back up the channel also it's very very fast we're talking about a tenth of a second here so you can't do anything about it when, when that happens and it is right. random as to which one of those channels or branches coming down actually strikes the ground and you simply don't want to be tall height um, isolated or uh, pointed that's what it's looking for trees are tall isolated and pointed mm -hmm. now i had a question on on facebook talking about lightning and glass uh, associated either glass in the car or glass in in a home uh, can can lightning go through glass, or does does glass somehow afford a protection uh, from lightning? What, how does lightning and, and glass work uh, or interact together? I don't really think it makes a whole lot of difference. Um, if you're in a car, it's going to go through the outer metal um, cage around you. I don't think it. I don't think I know of any cases where the glass has been broken. In a house, it's going to follow the wiring and plumbing when it comes through the power line or it hits the house itself, and it's going to go through those paths. So the glass is pretty incidental. Now I'm going to jump in here and add go something. Go ahead, James. Um, if I could. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, about five years ago, we had a lightning strike that was almost on our house here in, in Rio Rancho, it's probably a block away. Did not hit our house, but it did hit the nearby transformer and set a power surge into our house. And as a result of that, the air conditioning was running, which caused a fire in the house. Well, at least it burned the panels inside the HVAC, the, the uh, control modules, and that caused electrical fire, which set off all the alarms in the house and uh, got the uh, fire police or firefighters out here and uh, they then checked in the attic to make sure the wiring wasn't burning thankfully the wiring mm -hmm. wasn't burning but uh, it was hot enough through the surge to uh, burn stuff inside the house and it took out a number of appliances that were not on surge protection so uh, that would be my point as ron said you can't really predict where it's going to hit so you need to be prepared whether it's on your person or in your house and uh we can be prepared whether it's a lightning strike or other kind of electrical surge by just putting surge protectors or a home home surge protector on our house to uh, help protect against that possibility so there could be a secondary effect of fire because of that energy coming into your house so um, you don't have to be struck directly and still have consequences uh, from the lightning. Very true. 
Hey, I, I want to I want to real quickly talk to our friends in in San Diego. There, um, you know, I, I I kid around with uh, people in El Paso. I say we've got a lot of beach and not a lot of ocean. You guys have a lot of beach and a lot of ocean there. What are some of the safety precautions people need to take if they're headed down to the beach, or if you know they're going to find themselves you know along the ocean side there? I would say uh, just to be aware of the forecast, uh, the changing weather conditions. For beachgoers, we do issue beach hazard statements for lightning. Uh, those go out to all our lifeguards and they'll pull people off the beach. Uh, we also try to call them and give them a heads up if something's coming so that they know to kind of clear the beaches and make sure everyone gets to safety. Do you guys get uh, the sea breeze effect that kind of can kick off thunderstorms there? Um, not so much at the beaches. It's not like Florida. Our water is very cold. Um, so our sea breeze actually tends to stabilize things as opposed to um, create thunderstorms, at least at the beaches. Once it moves inland where you've got the hotter air, potentially more low-level moisture, say in the mountains and deserts, it can trigger thunderstorms there. But I don't think I've ever seen a case in the time that I've worked here where our sea breeze has... Um, generated thunderstorms close to the coast. Ah, very interesting. Very interesting how the difference between like Florida and um, uh, the, the, you guys have the colder water from the upwelling associated along the, the California coast there actually kind of will minimize and dampen down that threat. Um, but still, you've got a lot of people exposed on the beach. So I'm glad that you guys have something in place. Um, how do you communicate that out to the lifeguards? Is that uh, through a text message or do they have like a little computer in their little lifeguard station or what? How does that work? I'm not entirely sure how they receive our beach hazard statements, but uh, we also do call them. We've got a list of all the lifeguard headquarters up and down our two counties um, with beaches. So we do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> That is that is old fashioned in this age of Twitter and Facebook. Well, I did want to remind everybody because I hadn't had a chance to do that. Um, if you want to ask us a question, because we've had a couple questions come in on Facebook that we've tried to get answered, but feel free to if you're watching on Facebook to ask us a question there. I'm monitoring the Facebook feed, and we got Jorge and and Felipe and Leos are in there. I um, I'm also uh, monitoring our YouTube live chat. If you've got a question, drop it in there or on Twitter using the hashtag monsoon2017. Um, let me go back to, let me go back to uh, Dan here uh, with another safety tip. Oh, Dan, you're in the dark. There, there we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> Those motion lights. <laughs> I, I know your pain. We talked about people uh, who are like maybe hiking outside people. And we mentioned the lightning safety for people who are inside. Let's say we have a lot of, uh, you know, in the interior part, uh, the southwest. We also have a lot of, a lot of people. Any uh, to be aware of as far as lightning and water? Tim, Tim, I actually did not hear any of that. You were breaking up pretty bad. Sure. No, no, no problem. I'm asking if um, if there's any special precautions for lightning and water, like if you're at a lake or a pool. Well, you want you want to move away from the water. You want to get off the water. You know, you certainly don't want to be on the water in a lightning storm. Uh, water conducts the electricity from lightning very well. Uh, so the main thing is plan ahead, I would say. Don't get caught. Some uh, some of the more expensive boats, I believe, have some lightning surge protection. Uh, but I mean, why risk it? Just get off. Well, yeah, you, you bring up a good point because we we've talked this about this a couple of times that if you're out on a lake, a lake is a nice flat surface, and if you're out on a lake the tallest thing out there all of a sudden you are going to be several feet above the the surface of the lake so right there you make yourself like you mentioned earlier don't make yourself a target you're making yourself a target right there right then 
even if that doesn't happen, like like we've mentioned, water conducts electricity very well. And um, so if you're in the pool or anything, the lightning doesn't actually have to strike you. And like, like Ron had mentioned earlier, you do get that uh, secondary uh, effect where the lightning comes, uh, doesn't strike you directly, but more often it, it reaches out to you either through the roots of the tree, through the ground, or in this case, through the water. Um, and then also I've heard stories about like, uh, railroad tracks and fences. I hear that lightning can travel, and Ron, maybe you can tell a story or so. Lightning can travel for miles down like railroad uh, uh, rails or on, on, on long fence lines. Is, is that correct? I've never heard anything about rail, railroads. Um, okay. <clears throat> fence lines, again, are wire. Wire is made of metal. Metal is good for conducting electricity. Um, there are pictures of cattle killed who were huddled up against a barbed wire fence. I think I should mention something. If you go to the lightningsafety.noaa.gov, in the last 10 years, uh, John Jensenius at the Weather Service in Portland, Maine, maintains that off that site. And the number one category in the last 10 years is water-related activities. It's beaches, boating, fishing. That's the biggest general category in the last 10 years in the United States. Hey, Marissa, if you, uh, oh, no, wait, I, I got it here. Let me uh, let me share my screen. And Ron, uh, you talk about what's I'm going to pop up here on my screen. And it is a lightning density map of the United States. <clears throat> let me zoom back out here. How do I zoom back out? Boop. Are you seeing that, Ron? Mm, there it is. Whoop, it was there. OK. Oh. Yep, I make those. Yeah, that's OK. So explain. Yeah, explain to us what we're seeing here. These are cloud to ground flashes in flashes per square mile per year. And you can see by color coding, um, the highest three areas are in Florida. And then very close to that are along the Gulf Coast and uh, the Northern Gulf Coast. And then it decreases northward and westward in general. In general, it relates to the low level moisture and the depth of the moist layer. Um, if you look at the west where we're all interested, we see a lot of variability from um, one place to another due to mountain ranges and uh, escarpments like the Mugion Rim and uh, other things like that. So yeah, this is uh, this map has been prepared for quite a few years. We update it every year and post it on www.lightningsafety.noan.gov. But it really doesn't change much because it's, it's uh, very well uh, representative of the cloud to ground lightning flash uh, frequency. Now, once I, I can see, once you get into New Mexico and especially into Arizona and somewhat, as you can see in Southern California, I can kind of make out where the mountains are as far as where like topography is and the lightning is, am I, am I kind of interpreting that correctly there? Yes, actually boundaries of mountains and water bodies are better than higher elevations. If you look up there in Colorado, see that the highest elevations are actually a minimum in lightning it's because the cloud base is start the updrafts are starting so high there just isn't enough um, cape available potential energy to, to accomplish it whereas out on the plains the sloping terrain is actually very good at forcing storms so yeah I've looked at this for a lot for quite a long time <laughs> That's your bread and butter right there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, believe it or not, we've been talking for almost an hour now. And I, I, I want to give one more plea. If anybody has any lightning related questions to ask the panel, you can ask it on Facebook. I saw actually Ken Waters has joined. <laughs> He's from the Phoenix Weather Office. Uh, Elder Mueller joined on Facebook. If you've got a question, feel free to uh, uh, pop it into the Facebook chat or the, the YouTube chat, or you can uh, tweet us the question on, uh, like it says there on my lower third, uh, hashtag is monsoon2017. But as we kind of wrap things up, and I'm going to say, Ron, you're going to be last because <laughs> you're our guest speaker, but I'm going to go down the line and I'm going to kind of have everybody say, you know, what is one thing that you would encourage people to do when it comes to lightning and lightning safety? Uh, you know, like we've said, sound especially when it comes down to lightning, it, it comes down to our responsibility because it's so difficult to actually predict 
underneath that thunderstorm where that lightning strike is going to be. So give, give me your best lightning tip and um, we, will, uh, we will head on out for the evening. So Sean, what's your best uh, lightning tip or what would you like to leave people with tonight? Well, as I said at our monsoon awareness kickoff here in uh, Albuquerque, when thunder roars, go indoors. That's the best thing we can remember because it's easy to remember and, and that's a good tip. Be prepared on your person. I know that um, we, uh, it's mentioned that, you know, he doesn't like actually talking lightning safety outside. He says the best thing is to get inside. So if, if, if at all possible, get inside. Um, James, do you have a tip for us? Yes. Um, I would just like to mention real quick, going back to the inside the house and the question about the glass, um, a more relevant danger near the glass is the window pane, especially if it's a metal window pane. So stay, generally stay away from the windows because a lot of them do have metal. And uh, also very briefly, uh, NOAA has some statistics that indicate that approximately um, 85 to 88 percent of the people who get struck by lightning will survive but a lot of those people are going to need first aid so if you ever are with someone who gets struck by lightning it's supremely important to administer first aid as soon as possible uh, you don't have to worry about getting electrocuted by touching a person who's been struck by lightning. Um, they don't carry a charge after they've been struck. And if they're still alive, administer C begin to administer CPR and call 911. And if you're lucky enough to be near uh, a, defibril a defibrillator device, uh, use that if they're unconscious, but uh, certainly if they're unconscious, uh, use that sort of medical device and administer CPR and dial 911. Mr. Tim, you're muted. I'm sorry, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you guys had heard earlier, my, one of my dogs was barking, so I, I didn't want to entertain you with that. But one of the questions that just came on Facebook is what would happen when you're struck by lightning? And, and just like, like James said, the lightning actually passes through you very quickly. It delivers a quick shock to your system. But um, it, it, our heartbeat actually runs on electricity. It's a, a, kind of an electrical shock. And, and when you pass that electricity through you, it can actually throw that heart rhythm off. And that in many ways, that's what happens that the heart actually stops beating. And just like James said, immediately uh, I've started applying, you know, check for a pulse and, and start to either use a CPR or if you have the E, I think it's the AED or the EAD, uh, the defibrillator will will get Automatic that try to get that heartbeat start going again, and um, administer that uh, that that CPR and that first aid immediately. And and like like James said, uh, the, one of the old wives' tales with lightning uh, is that the the a shock or a, the, the the voltage on them, but it has already passed through them. There's just no problem with touching them. So that's a, a great uh, great word of advice. Dan, do you have anything for people to say or uh, any words of wisdom? Uh, same thing I said yesterday, check uh, your forecast before you start your activities. You know, we get many visitors here in Flagstaff uh, to do outdoor, you know, hiking, mountain biking, go to the Grand Canyon. Uh, so get your weather forecast, talk with the locals once you're there and uh, be careful. Now, I, um, another question just came in on Facebook basically asking and maybe ron you can address this real quickly uh, it's actually from a co-worker who's up in kansas city they have thunderstorms up there right now is there is there anything different in lightning associated with the monsoon season as opposed to lightning that you might see at the plains or is it just the same thing and we just kind of concentrate all of our lightning activity during the the, the monsoon season uh, that's a good <clears throat> good question actually i looked at the data for arizona a couple of years ago and 70 
6% of our lightning for the whole year is in July and August. And wow. in the rest of the country, it's 45%. So we are really concentrated. The lightning phenomenon in itself is essentially the same thing. It's a one inch channel that comes down from a loft and uh, has the same size and measurements. So it's not different intrinsically. Very good. That's that's what I figured, but I, I wanted to I wanted to ask. Uh, real quickly, let's go out to the San Diego office and uh, see if Miguel or Stephanie have any words of wisdom as we wrap things up today. Uh, yeah, um, I liked what Dan and Flagstaff said about being uh, informing yourself uh, before you go outside for any long periods of time. And I would even add to that, um, make a plan for yourself too. Uh, because if you go on a you know three or four day backpacking trip or something like that, or you're going to spend a lot of time camping or whatever, then uh, have some sort of escape plan ready to go in case you know the, the big black buildup start uh, start up and you start to hear the rumbling. Uh, you've got to know where you are and where safety is. There might not be any safeties, but ha have a plan ready. And another thing I wanted to add here in San Diego. Thunderstorms and lightning strikes are a lot more common during the winter near the coast and in the valleys. And, and I don't know, I, I, most of those come with a lot of rain, so you're not gonna get a lot of people during the, it's the relatively cold season. It's not technically very cold in the winter on the coast, but, but, uh, <laughs> but when people see the rain gushing down and stuff um, with these thunderstorms in the wintertime, they're probably not gonna be outside golfing and doing all of these activities. Uh, even over the ocean, where there would be more, uh, there would be more danger. And in the summertime, of course, it's a mountain and desert phenomenon, and usually just in the late summer. So, um, so you know, we need to do our job and help people uh, during the winter time uh, near the coast to be a little bit more aware of what can happen. But like I say, the rain usually pushes them indoors, and there's more indoors around. And then in the summertime. Uh, when people are out um, uh, for long periods of time outside. I like, I like what Ron said. Oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. uh, one thing I wanted to add just from a personal experience is to not become complacent about lightning, especially in um, areas that have thunderstorms fairly frequently. Coast of San Diego isn't one of them, but there was um, a time I was on vacation in Florida during the summer out at the beach started to get some buildups. I was out there, you know, taking pictures and whatever, but I was keeping an eye on the sky and the radar. And once it was, you know, time to go, I made sure to head back to the house, but I'm looking around and everyone else is still just hanging out on the beach, not thinking a thing of it. Um, maybe it's because they're like, oh, we get thunderstorms all the time, whatever, I'm fine. Um, so don't think that you're immune to it just because it happens all the time and you haven't been struck and it's fine. We can wait till it starts raining to go inside. Um, like other people have said, you hear thunder, thunder roars, go indoors. Um, yeah, that's all I had. And it's very true. We, we, we've said it over and over again that it's, we need to, you have to take responsibility for yourself because the, just of the randomness of, of lightning, you know, we can see the thunderstorms coming, you know, we in the weather service can let people know where they are, where they're moving to, but the lightning is just such a small kind of weather element and it occurs so randomly that people need to take responsibility if they're out at the lake, out of the pool, at their outside. Like Ron has said over and over again, don't, don't think about what you should do. Get inside, get inside to a well-built structure, get inside to a car and get yourself to a safe place because um, being outside just puts you at, at risk. Um, Ron, I'm, I left you for the last. Uh, can you kind of wrap things up for us as far as uh, lightning and lightning safety goes for tonight? Well, I'm going to turn the conversation on, on its side. I'm you know, becoming very um, involved in lightning safety and education in Africa and Southeast Asia, such as Bangladesh and India. Um, when you think of the situations there, when you look, and we're gathering, finally gathering some data, people do not have a safe dwelling where they live. They're made out of a uh, thatched roof or mud huts that are not lightning safe. The schools are not safe and so children are, uh, large numbers of them are killed five or 10 every few weeks in a school somewhere in Africa. 
um, and they work in labor intensive agriculture outside. They have no vehicles to go to. And so I say that in the US and developed countries, we actually have sort of an easy solution to the light and safety issue in that we have safe buildings and we have um, fully enclosed metal top vehicles to go to most of the time for most people. So for much of the population in the world, this is not actually the case. And so when thunder roars go indoors, it works in our society, but it doesn't work at all in these societies. So what what is your suggestion for them? Or what are you trying to work with them as far as education goes? Well, education, first of all, just where and when fatalities and injuries are occurring. I just did a paper published uh, on Bangladesh a couple of weeks ago. Um, we have an organization starting in Africa because of the school problem. We're trying to come up with funding to put lightning protection on schools where there could be hundreds of children inside. And uh, the schools right now are not safe. And so there are unfortunately a lot of cases of multiple fatalities going on. So we're going one school at a time, which is going to be an enormous effort. But if we can show that the schools can be made safe and the children are safe, then that will start the thought process that maybe we can do something elsewhere. But it's a matter of resources because it's not intrinsically not uh, cheap. It has to be done right. Because metal that conducts a, a lightning strike has to be at least substantial enough to conduct it. And that's... That's where we are right now. So anyway, it's a big project. If you want to look it up, called ACLE NET, ACLE NET, African Centers for Lightning and Electromagnetics NET, dot com, yeah, dot, dot, dot org. Anyway, so this is a, like I said, this turns the whole conversation on its side because it's not quite relevant to the developed world like the US. Well, and actually it just drives home the threat that, or the idea that, you know, and we, we mentioned it just a minute ago when we were talking about is there a difference between lightning in the monsoon season versus lightning in the Midwest. Lightning is lightning anywhere in the world, and it, it is a threat to people. And in the first place to be uh, is educate yourself um, and try to be aware of what the weather is going to be. Is there thunderstorms in the forecast? If so, um, I think it was Miguel that said, if, if you know that there's going to be thunderstorms in the forecast, have a plan in place to be able to react to it. Uh, and then like Ron had said earlier, if you try to shelter outside, um, we, we talked about the safe things to do is to avoid the trees, the tall trees, avoid the ridge lines. But if all possible, have a plan to where you could get to uh, an indoor uh, building or a vehicle. And I, we didn't even get a chance to talk on like uh, stadium safety and uh, venues and things like that. We could, we could, we could spend another hour here talking about other lightning safety tips, but I, 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 I want to thank everyone for <laughs> taking the time that they, they've spent with us tonight, uh, both on the panel and, and the people who've joined us on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so we'll have to save that for another time. Go ahead, James. Thank you. Oh, you betcha. I, and I do want to I want to thank everybody real quick. I want to thank James over in Phoenix. I want to thank Dan up in Flagstaff. Miss Marissa always pulling the graphics. Cool slow-mo video. We had Sean over in the Albuquerque office. And uh, Stephanie and Miguel were kind enough to join us again from San Diego. And then, of course, our special guest tonight was Ron Hawley. Uh, our lightning expert from Vaisala who does and and Ron explain real quickly why Vaisala why are you even associated with lightning and how uh, th they have the lightning detection network well I'm actually I was with NOAA for 38 years and I've been here for some time here in Tucson um, I was in the research labs the uh, invention of the lightning detection network the real-time lightning detection network came from the University of Arizona here the Tucson Weather Up Service Office is actually one campus. It was developed and literally invented in 1976 on campus at the Atmospheric Science Department. And as soon as that uh, invention was made known, customers came immediately asking for networks to go in in uh, Alaska and the western U.S. for forest fires, and then a whole host of other people came along. And so the control center running the network for the U.S. and for the world is, is here in Tucson because of that background. Wow, oh, very good. Very interesting. So they, they monitor, help to monitor lightning all across the United States and I believe all around the world these days, right? 
Yes, we have a new network covering the world. We're averaging about a million and a half strokes a day now in the global network. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. And I, I wish we had more time to talk about all of that. But I want to move on. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about, we're going to be wrapping up uh, Monsoon Awareness Week. Ah, I forgot to mention, today is June 15th. It's the official start of the monsoon season. So monsoon season officially started today and runs through September 30th. We've already talked about heat, downburst winds, blowing dust. We covered lightning today. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about uh, flash flooding, which is definitely a threat that uh, is a, a problem here in the Southwest with the topography that we have with the, uh, the, 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 the rain, that we get the very intense rainfalls over that topography. So please join us. Check your local weather office's social media feeds uh, for the, 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 the link to the YouTube feed or on Facebook. And basically, uh, please join us tomorrow as we'll have a great discussion on flash flood. Again, I want to thank the entire panel. You guys did a great job. I really enjoyed having this discussion with everyone. We could have gone on for another hour. It was great talking with everybody. And I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining us. And have a great evening. All right. See everybody later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tim.